Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Continuing our <coughs> last um, parts of this series on the purification of our souls, our hearts and our minds. Um, we're now going to talk about that comfort and joy that we will all be in the gravest need for when we die. And so last week we talked about the reality of passing from this life and passing uh, from our physical world and being kept technically with our physical body uh, as a preparation for the Day of Judgment and then the realities of the grave and that there will be people punished in the grave and there will be people who will be feeling the delight and the comfort and the expanse and the breadth and the visions of paradise and happiness. So inshallah now we'll begin talking about the actual reality of the Day of Resurrection the day of resurrection in itself, and how there are two realities of people. There are people who will go through extreme terror and horror and fearful, dangerous reality that, um, that we would all want to protect ourselves from. And then there will be a whole other group of people who will be in comfort and ease and a joy in meeting that reality. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began Surah Al-Hajj أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم إن زلزلة الساعة شيء عظيم All mankind, you should all be conscious and fearful of the eventual meeting with your Creator because there will be a day that will be a very serious day that everyone will face. And so then it goes on, um, we want to save as much time as we can, so we'll give you the translation of the few realities that are very, I, I guess, not expecting, in that in that day, whenever it happens, some woman who is pregnant, she will immediately miscarry her child. A woman who is trying to breastfeed her child thinking she's in a state of comfort and compassion for her child will probably drop her child and be in complete uh, terror of what's going on. And people will be running around when that day hits like they're drunken, but they have not drank any sort of alcohol or intoxicating beverage. So this is definitely uh, a scary sight. It is, it is something that we right now in our state of comfort that we live in should be ready for. Well, the fact of the matter is most people will not be there when the actual day of judgment hits. But we will talk in detail more about the realities that come after that when people are resurrected from their graves and the actual judgment begins. But on that day, it begins, فَإِذَا نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورِ As in Surah Al-Muddathir. On that day when the trumpet is blown, there is an angel um, in Arabic, he is called Israfil. He will blow a trumpet by the command of God. And when that trumpet is first blown, everything in the whole universe will be hit with a major hit. And it will bring upon this chaos. Whenever he blows the trumpet a second time, the whole universe will fold up. The whole entire universe will fold up. And um, this is one of those um, scientific... Um, indications in the Qur'an that are quite um, co uh, concordance with the modern science that has been established. The way things are considered to be in the world that we live in is a result of this Big Bang, this explosion that happened at some point in history um, or at the beginning of history, uh, to be technical. So that's mentioned in the Qur'an. Similarly, يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءَ كَطَيْنِ السِّجِينِ لِلْكُتُبِ كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ In the end of Surah Al-Anbiya, it says that on that day of judgment, we will take the whole universe like scrolls. You know how scrolls, they have these two um, uh, sticks that have the, the, the parchment wrapped around them, and you open it up and close it. So that is exactly how the Qur'an refers to the end of days. Well, there is a, the, um, the big crunch is a new theory in the last 30 years that they have developed about the nature of the universe expanding, expanding, and then it will implode at some point on itself through some sort of reaction of gravity. So this is one of the beauty 
of our Qur'an is in complete compatibility with modern science. So it says that that second trumpet will be blown. And then, فَذَلِكَ يَوْمَ يَوْمَ إِذٍ عَسِيرٌ That this day will be hard for people. عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ غَيْرُ يَسِيرٌ On that day it will be for disbelievers, no, no simple reality. It will be a harsh reality of horror and complete dismay. So that's a reality that is going to be there. Either you have this, what we've been talking about, this horror, this fright, this fear, this trembling, sad, scared state, or what we have in others. لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر On that day, the true believers, when the day of judgment hits, they will not be scared or saddened at all. وَتَتَلَقَّاهُمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And the angels will reach out to them. هَذَا يَوْمُكُمُ الَّذِي كُنْتُمْ تُوْعَدُونَ This is the day that you were promised and now it is coming. And the scholars of our uh, tafsir or our commentary on the Holy Qur'an mention that their faces will be um, delighted, they will be enlightened, they will be happy to face the day of judgment. So that's the reality of a believer. Not a believer who said, I'm a believer. A believer who acted like a believer. Someone who really truly soaked up the knowledge and the revelation and the prophethood and that became something that they held dear that moved them in their life to do what they do and prevented them to stay away from the things that they stayed away from. So that's how faith is manifested. And on that day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make easy and save those who are conscious of their responsibility towards Him, and that is a result of their success. Their success, they saw, was not in a matter of how much money I attained, not what degree I attained, not what status or label I attained in society. Rather, it was how much obedience and servitude and gratitude did I express towards my Creator. That is the true success. So then it says, لا يمسهم السوء On that day, no harm, no evil, nothing should they be scared of on the Day of Judgment, a true believer that's prepared for this day. There will be no hardship or difficulty that will afflict them. وَلَهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And they will not be sad about leaving this life, right? They will not be sad. See, many people are attached to this life. And if death seems to come, they get sad and scared and upset and anxiety. That's not the state of a true believer who understands that this life is not a place of abode. Rather, it is a place of, um, it's like passing. It's like we're just visitors. We are just traveling through this land, living this test, proving ourselves to our Lord that we are grateful for being created and all of the blessings He has provided us. Most uh, prominent of those is His guidance, that we embrace that and we live accordingly. So when we look at this, this is the other side of the coin. We definitely want to put ourselves in that situation. Um, that's the way we should lead our lives, that's the way we should prepare ourselves because none of us know at which time will death come upon me. Death is something that will hit just like that and none of us, uh, very rarely is it that someone's actually ready for that moment. It's most often hitting somebody as it says in the Quran, baghta, all of the sudden. So we should prepare ourselves with this eventual meeting with our Creator. So some of the ways that the people of rebellion and disbelief and corruption and sin uh, when we say um, the evil people or the disbelievers um, we mean people who did major sins people who did not fulfill their responsibility people who were heedless maybe they're called Muslim maybe they believe in their heart somewhere deep down that there is one God and he's my creator but they led a lifestyle they didn't pray much they were doing major sins and they didn't care the the revelation and spirituality and and their relationship to their Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was not a priority it was something secondary or third third area right it was not something that was seen on the priority in their life right and so that's where we should make ourselves people who see that the priority is, where am I with my Creator? Right? When we wake up in the morning, that's why the Prophet Wasallam he used to make this supplication. Alhamdulillahi ladhi ahyani ba'dama amatani wa ilayhi nishur. That, 
um, the praise and the gratitude is the one that gives me life. Even when I go through this seemingly death every night, I'm given life again. And the question is, what will I do with my life? Am I living my life? Am I planning to live my life to meet with Him? Am I preparing to meet back with Him? Because we were created from a very personal reality with Him. That's why He says, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي This is a very special relationship we all have with our Creator. That when we were born, when we were given this life, we were given this um, awareness of self and purpose. When we were built with that, that was a result of Him putting something very special that He created our spirit, our soul into us. Now we're somewhat, in a, in a, I guess so as to speak, away from Him in this life. But we are, the more we're connected to Him, the more we're ready at any moment to meet Him, the more we are proving that we are very grateful for that reality that He has blessed us with. The more we try to move away from that spiritual reality called the soul, the spirit, we become material. And so with that material self, you start to want things based upon your ego, your desires, what you can gain, what you can benefit, and you lose that beauty of selflessness. That selflessness of wanting to do good, spread mercy and compassion for others' benefit. To be happy to see others having things, even if you don't even have it. Right? So that's what we're going to actually talk about today. One of the major... Um, afflictions outside of people being raised on the Day of Judgment on their face and having angels dragging them along their face, other people being resurrected on the ground and people running over them and trampling them, other people being raised um, naked without anything on, other people are being raised on the Day of Judgment, arrogant people are raised on the Day of Judgment like ants and people keep smashing them and stepping on them regularly. Aside from all of that is that people's sins and their deviation from their Creator and their purpose in life, it will cause a sweat because the sun is brought close to the earth on the Day of Judgment. And so that sun is just beating hard, right? And so the sweat, the people's sweat is going to be coming up to their knees and their waist. Some of them are going to be drowning in their sweat for 50,000 years while the day of judgment is happening. I mean, this is a very serious reality. It's all that some people say that just sounds too crazy, sounds too comic book, sounds too wild. Well, what it is is our we've been given this spiritual awareness. We've been given the tools and this programmed reality of right and wrong. We know it. Every last one of us, atheist, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, whoever you are, you know right and wrong. Now, once you've embraced a scripture, you've recognized pure revelation, wahi. Now you have a big responsibility on your back because you've embraced a pure message from your Lord to you. And so for somebody after recognizing that, to take that as not consequential to their life, that person has brought upon themselves a major harm. It's a, when, we, you know, when we say God created man in His image, we mean we've been given this creative ability to do what we want. We have a potential that is amazing. I mean, when we look at what humans are doing and creating, uh, obviously we have this big special potential, this big gift from our Lord. The question is, how will we use it? Did we use our words for good things, or did we use them for bad things? Did we use our ears to hear something good and beneficial, or did we spread corruption in our ears? Did we look at things that will benefit us, or did we look at things that will harm us? The question is, how are we living our life. And so as a result of all of those things, when people deviate, that sun is going to hit them. They will be closer to the sun the more sins they did. There will be seven groups of people as the Prophet ﷺ that will be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the focus, uh, subject matter, what we want to talk about today, inshallah. These people are in a shade um, because of some purification. What we've been talking about over the last... Uh, nine months, um, these people are people who were rejecting a uh, self-focused, egotistical life that's based upon desires and self-wanting. Um, they rejected that and they were able to overcome that by being a spiritual person that sees with the divine light of guidance, as we talked about a few weeks ago with the wisdom and how uh, guidance will influence somebody to interact with all situations based upon some sort of ayah or hadith of the Prophet ﷺ or event that he lived in his life, right? 
So these seven categories are not the only people who will be in the shade, but they reflect a certain uh, struggle and the success that one would attain through winning that struggle. And in the world right now, what we see going on, the first category is quite significant. And that is Al-Imam Al-Adl, the just leader. The word Imam in Arabic, um, it can mean many different things. In the context of this hadith, it means a leader, someone who is responsible for other people. Um, the technical meaning would be a leader of the state, right? See, our secular world that we live in, for even after the Khulafa al Rashidin, like in the time of the Prophet Wasallam, I'm sure you've heard, those, especially those that you speak Arabic or have heard an Arabic lecture, Imam al Muttaqin. You've heard this, that the Prophet Wasallam was the Imam of the uh, pious, God-conscious people, right? This doesn't mean he just led prayers. It means he led everyone in everything, right? And so after the Prophet Wasallam, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, anytime they went anywhere in their ummah, they were asked to lead the prayers and they were seen as the main reference for leadership, right? So now in our modern world, the leader has no ability to lead a prayer, nor is he at a mosque at any sort of uh, um, regular passing. Um, but that's, that's something that we've lost in this ummah, where our leaders have a spiritual connection and vibe that they carry about them. Even in Bani Umayyah and the Abbasi, even in those times, those were kings and the way it was passed down was not necessarily the most Islamic, shura, authentic way of passing down leadership, but still most of them memorized a large portion of the Qur'an. They were understanding the laws of Islam and the Islamic um, teachings and sciences, and they were able to lead prayers quite efficiently. So now the Ummah has been secularized and Ba'athistized and communistized and democratized and whatever. Now we need to be, our alhamdulillah, our system has all of that it needs within it. We need nobody else to add something to Islam to make it better or correct or authentic, right? Our tradition is perfectly capable of dealing with all times, all peoples and all places in a just, fair, uh, logical, reasonable way. So we need to go to that. So the first category of the people who will have this special shade of these special clouds, according to another narration, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be, be, be between them and the actual son, um, is the just ruler. So this is somebody who has a large people under their authority and they choose to lead with justice. They choose to sacrifice their time, their money, their wealth, their status for the well-being of those who they are in charge of, right? That was the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some people used to, some people try to say, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was just a poor man. We, we read hadith that Aisha Radiallahu Anha said that they had, they had a whole day, they only ate some dates and drank some water as their meals. This isn't because they didn't have money. This is because when they got money, they gave it all away. Yes, this is regular. When the spoils of war came, the Prophet ﷺ and his wives used to methodically pass that money out to the people who were most in need. It was like something that they were itching to do, right? It was a whole different world of reality where they would give money and be like, oh, you know that brother, that sister, let's go visit them and let's put some light into their face. Let's put some good into their life. That was the immediate... A getting money, it was about now I can help someone else. Immediately was their thinking process, right? And so that's a mentality that we've left. The Prophet ﷺ, when people came to visit him, and came to visit Omar after him, when they came from, as ambassadors from these other states, they would come and they would say, okay, come here, this is the hut where he lives. And they're like, okay, where's the palace? What, where's the palace? No, there's no palace. This is, this is the Prophet's hut. Then they go in there. And there is nothing in there. No gold, no silver, nothing. He doesn't wear silk, he doesn't wear gold. But why don't you have... He could! Everybody embraced him as a prophet. If he was a false prophet, you know, he would have done like many other false prophets and leaders have done. Built big palaces and gold and silk. And all. Obviously, he wasn't about this world. He was preparing for that day as a just leader. Because by nature, power is an is a, um, intoxicating reality. It will make somebody feel like they own the others. Like the others need to support them. When no, the nature of being a leader is that you mobilize others to grow and progress and be better and more 
um, stable in their reality, that you provide a, a reality for them that they're in a comfort zone. And what that means, generally speaking, in Islamic context, that you sacrifice your own situation. Omar radiallahu anhu, in the night times and the day times, he used to walk around Medina just talking to people and looking around and visiting and seeing how everybody was on the, what do they call it, on uh, Main Street? Yeah, he was a Main Street imam. So, we could definitely make an analogy about this first um, characteristic of the people who will be in a comfortable setting in the shade, in a nice, happy, comfortable, joyous situation on the Day of Judgment while others are going through the most horrendous realities with even a father of a household or a mother of her children. If you have people under your authority and you are treating them like they um, like they are your subjects and you own them and they should conform to everything you want without thinking about their needs and their interests and what's benefiting for them then of course we're not fulfilling um, the meaning of a just leader a just ruler someone who has a just um, influence over those who they technically have authority over they don't use their authority to own people and control people they use their authority to make people better they try to raise their level they try to make those people in a more comfortable and a better state of, of being. So that was the first um, category that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned. The second category is someone who is, uh, or a child. Shabbun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A child, a young person who was raised in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So somebody might think well why is that so significant a child you know you can make your child you can't really make your child anyone that have children in this room it's very difficult to make them worship uh, that's a very difficult thing right um, but if you are able to as your just leadership dictates to bring an environment where that child wants and enjoys and is interested in worshiping then that child and obviously the parent that 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 instilled that environment and that comfort zone are going to be in the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the general nature of kids is, I want mine, right? I want it for myself. I want to do this. I want to do that. You can't tell me, you know. And they get more sophisticated as they get older with this. Right, Obada? You know, I love the brother myself. This is, this is the nature of trying to make one's own identity, is that you want to stake your ground, right? I will do this, I will do that, nobody can stop me, I'm going to do it. And so the more you get older, the more knowledge, the more strength of self that you get, the more comfortable you feel thinking you're right and the other one is wrong, even if they're your authority, right? So this is just the nature. So someone who is being raised to just worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they pray, they fast, they have a lot of remembrance, they seek a lot of knowledge, they have this um, worship, this general servitude and obedience, um, that is not the norm for kids. Um, I know a brother um, that um, became Muslim whenever he was 18 years old, and uh, he was in a he was in a tough environment um, and with a tough group of people before that. And he started searching and read some scriptures and had some things that he faced, and he ended up embracing Islam and becoming, mashallah. Um, very solid in knowledge and practice and so forth. And the people are just amazed. Actually, on the one magazine, um, the one of the local magazines or, or city, you know, journals or whatever, um, wanted to do an interview with this guy because they were asking him, you know, these days kids that are 18, you know, they're like, you know, just trying the club out. Now they just got the key. I can get into the club, right? It's 18 years old. This is the you know, this is now I'm officially an adult, right? I make my own decisions, technically speaking, in the Western culture, right? And so they were asking this guy, you know, and this brother was just like, you know, I saw the world around me. I saw it was no good and corrupt and all of that. And I was looking for truth. I was looking for purpose. And after researching, I came to, to Islam. The same thing as the, a younger child is. If a young child that's 9, 10 years old recognizes this, we should be very quick. But sadly, what do most parents are concerned about. What's the most important thing to parent, Muslim parents here in the West specifically? What grades on your report card? Isn't it? That is the priority. Straight A's, right? Didn't pray? Okay, that's fine. You'll grow up. You'll figure that out later. 
Yes, let's be honest with ourselves. Let's deal with these things. Let's make ourselves a better people. Let's clean ourselves of the British colonial remote controlling after they left the physical occupation. Yeah, that's what they're doing. They brought these ideas that you're this and that because you became a doctor. You're this and that because you became a lawyer, engineer, a business owner. That's what makes you great in life, right? That's success. It says, Bif mafazatihim. That the people that are shaded on the day of judgment, the people that are saved on the day of judgment, they get that because of their success. No scholar put under success that they became doctor or lawyer, and none of that was not anybody's understanding from the whole history of Islam. That was a British concept brought French and Italian and imprinted on our forefathers' minds, and here in America it's being done as well, that that is what makes you successful. That's what gives you the right to be seen as prominent or a noble figure in our society. When in fact there could be somebody that's job is to uh, cut the grass and clean the street. And yet their worship and knowledge and sincerity is higher than you know, someone else that's a doctor or an engineer. That person's going to have the true mafaz. So we have to clear our mind and clarify to ourselves what is our life about and what are we doing here and how will we succeed with this life so we need to inco incorporate that in our children's lives we need I'm totally a proponent of following the example of the Prophet Sallallahu I've been to Islamic schools they bring four and five year old kids and they're like okay pray the Salah and then they get mad when they're laughing and pin pinching and chewing gum and all of this and okay but they're five the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the hadith says when they're seven Teach them how to pray. At what point did you decide you had a better idea about what time to start teaching your kids when to pray over the Prophet Sallallahu Well, but Imam, it's an Islamic school. Okay, don't but anything when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam مَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَ That it is not for any believing man or woman when God and His Messenger have made a decision to have any decision in the matter, right? But we've developed these cultures and these ways of expressing Islam that aren't authentically prophetic in their guidance. And what they often do is alienate kids. You're to follow these rules, you're not, you are laughing in your salah. He's five! He's gonna laugh everywhere he goes all day. What are you talking about? So this is a reality that we have to understand when raising our kids and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to uh, truly incorporate a comfort zone. If they want to pray up to seven, let them pray. So come pray, it's fine if you want. If you don't want, fine, just please don't and, uh, you know, cause some uh, interference with what we're doing. And even if they cause interference, what does the Prophet Sallallahu do? They're climbing on his back wagon, right? He picks them up and holds them. Or stays in sujood until they get off his back, right? That was the Prophet Sallallahu playing around with kids and so forth. We need to teach kids about seeking knowledge and the precedence of that in the Islamic um, tradition. And that needs to become the key. We need to make sure that we are not proud that our kids learn this and that and they can't tell you what Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. We just had after Salat al -Dhur, We asked a whole weekend school that we're supposedly teaching them and I own up to at least the group that I'm teaching um, that they did not know what that means. Not one of them. Not one. I'm not saying we need to just all become completely literate in Arabic, but these are two pillar pretty much things. They're in the Adhan and the Salah and all of this. I think we need to know those things very well, right? So teaching our youth at a, at a young age to appreciate um, remembrance. Another thing, we teach most Muslims aren't Arabs. And then we teach them all these supplications. I've met brothers. Allahumma rabba hadhi da'ati tam wa salat al-qa'ima. Brothers in their 40s and 50s from non-Arabic speaking countries. And I say, you say that dua, what did that mean? I don't know, I've been saying it since I was a kid. But what's the benefit of making a supplication if you don't, are you, is the Prophet Sallallahu really getting blessed? Do you, even some of them said, I don't even know why I'm saying it. Just, this is what I was told, this, I memorized the thing, I don't know. No, Iman, Khushu'a, true faith should come from your heart. It should be something that you own, that you mean. It is something that you have a deep attachment to an expression of when you're, uh, when, you're, when you're doing it, right? So whether it's prayer or supplication, we need to make sure that if we're teaching, if you want to teach them Arabic, that's fine. It's your business if you feel that it will stick with them. Otherwise, I would say 
experience says that in many cases kids spend hours and hours and hours memorizing things in Arabic and they don't ever know that never means anything to them in their whole life right so let's make sure at least that they own their spirituality and their worship and they feel inclined to do it because that's something that comes naturally to them and the way things come naturally to you if you're learning them is that it was taught in a language that you can comprehend so that's I think another aspect of making sure the facilitation for kids growing up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there the third uh, category are, is رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُتَعَلِّقٌ بِالْمَسْجِدِ A person whose heart is attached to the mosque. The reason this is is because although the Prophet ﷺ said that from the five things he's been given الْأَرْجُعِلَتْ لِي مَسْجِدًا that the whole entire earth was made a place for me and my ummah to prostrate and, play, and pray outside of the um, graveyard and the um, and the bathroom. These are the two exceptions. The whole earth has been made a place for us to pray. But we were called upon and told to build mosques. To build a specific place of worship that's purpose, its sole purpose is a daily hajj. It is a daily place where believing hearts get together, unify themselves in their tawheed, in their monotheistic inclination they feel an attachment to each other they don't just you know sadly even I because I, I brought this up with some brothers when I was in the Muslim world mashallah you have mosques on every corner people come and they go so I'll stop people I'll be like salam alaikum brother alaikum salam I gotta go eat alaikum salam I gotta go to work like, no but we're here for a reason man just give me a couple minutes let's do some ta'aruf you know right and so, you know, I felt that this prayer is just like this superficial thing, get it done, go to the mosque and finish it up, right? I'm not saying spend hours on end, but at least, you know, take a number of your Muslim brother or sister, visit with them, get to know them, feel a comfort. That's why it's there. That's why there is a Salatul Jama'ah. That's why we're saying, إِهْدِنَا الصَّلَاةُ الْمُسْقَةِ That's why we're saying, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ We're saying, only you, we worship, not I worship. It's not a personal, individual thing. It's a, un it's a unity. It's a collective worship and so that mosque is meant to be so in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu the mosque was packed every single prayer was like Jumu'ah in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of course they all live within a mile of the mosque right that's one big reality we're not saying that you're all expected to fulfill that here when many of us live 9-10 miles from the mosque right but what we're saying is this hadith this category of people is someone who says I know I have a family I know I have a job, I know I have everything, but my ummah and my Lord are most dear to me. So I want to be out at the mosque as much as possible, as much as possible. Tying in with my brothers in faith, tying in with my sisters in faith, having that faith bond with people regularly, every single day, as much as I possibly can. That was something that built a... Uh, a rapport amongst the companions that actually in itself was a major factor in dissolving tribalistic uh, division um, that they had in that day. They were all tribes. And so they used to have, it, like for example, before, when the Prophet was in Mecca, what was the situation of Masjid al-Haram? There was no Masjid al-Haram, but there was an area called Haram, which all of Mecca technically was, always looked like, like that. But the <coughs> area right around the Kaaba, you would have tribes. <coughs> this tribe's in here, this tribe's in that corner, this tribe's in that corner. That's how they were. But when the Muslims started to pray, there was no tribes. There was a precedence of being in the front and closer to the middle. One hadith narrates on the right, but there's some issues, it's a long discussion about that thing. We won't waste our time with it now because we're focusing on something else. But that was the focus. It doesn't matter what tribe you're from, what status, what, how much money you make. It's a matter of just being here together with you because you are here for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I'm here for the same reason, right? So the one whose heart is attached to the mosque, being there, brotherhood, sisterhood, making the mosque a better place, painting it, fixing the windows, whatever it may be, that is a very special reality. To hold this place in a higher um, a higher relevance, a higher prominence in your life, right? That's sad. I get so sad when I see that when Muslims go to their regular job, <coughs> they get there on time and they park correctly, right? <laughs> but when they go to the mosque, it's like this lower standard, right? The kids, if they go any public place, 
son, daughter, this is the way we are. We're going straight to the place that takes care of kids. But we just let them run wild and not crazy here. Yeah. This is not the way that this hadith is telling us. The way we're supposed to be is having this love, this attachment embedded in our hearts for the place that unifies the believers, the center, the markaz. Markaz in Arabic, center. The place that people are gravitated and magnetized to. So it means that it should be a generally active place. In the life of the Prophet Sallallahu there was doctors that were known for whatever medical capability they had back then, they would be in the mosque. They would be doing their thing. There were meetings to talk about political realities with Jews and so forth. There were meetings talking about wars and imminent danger with that. There were discussions about Islamic legal discourse and so forth. Regularly in the mosque, there were people and situations happening. It was a lively place. Sadly, these days we'll find mosques are open every now and then and some few people, some elder folks with some beards come in and pray. Yeah. That's not the way it should be. I'm, especially those that come from the Muslim world. It's like, you know, there's just 20 guys, you know, same, you know, they almost look like identical. <laughs> it should be a lively place. Jawad's there, sisters there, all of them is there. We have to be honest. In the life of the Prophet Sallallahu the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi testified that we, it's all, so many authentic hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and the great collections of hadith that women were in the mosque praying all of the obligatory prayers, right? So many of our scholars said that it is a highly recommended thing, if not obligatory for the woman to pray in Jama'ah. Somebody might say, now hold on. But what happened to the hadith about women need to stay at home and pray, right? Well, if you understand that hadith, with these hadiths, as some of the scholars like Muhammad Shanqiti, Daidu Shanqiti, said, is that obviously the Prophet is talking to a specific case because we can't imagine that our mothers, our examples of righteous women, would be going against the preferred conduct with regards to the prayer. And so since they were mentioned, Aisha and Umm Salama and others, to praying in the mosque regularly. And he said, in, I, in my mosque, the men pray at the front. And then the kids behind them, and then the women.